Well, thank you very much, uh, choir. Um, that was very, uh, very encouraging, uh, very appropriate words, and, and a very appropriate song. This is what we're going to seek to do this morning, is to give all glory uh, to the Lord and to, to glorify His name. Let us um, come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you that we can be in your presence this morning. Father, we just uh, want to come before you to lift up your name, to give you all the glory that is due to your name. We just want to thank you for your love towards us. We thank you for the opportunity to receive your word this morning, and we just pray that you would bless this service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our, our theme for this current series of messages is entitled, The Glory of the Lord, and it's taken from Luke chapter 2. You know, I, I look forward to learning from this series of messages in the lead up to Christmas, where, of course, our focus will once again be on the Lord, on glorifying Him and glorifying our Savior, the Lord Jesus you know, I love that this is the focus of Bethel, you know, the focus on the Lord. Because in life, I guess, it could be said that our focus tends to be on something else. As we go through life, our focus tends to be on oneself. In fact, they often say that, you know, um, all you really need in life is to look after number one, which is yourself. In the working world, well, this is also true. You know, to get ahead, you really do need to master the art of self-promotion, that is, promoting yourself. You know, it can be much harder to get ahead in life or in work if you don't know how to show others um, your value of your works. For some people, this kind of self-promotion, it becomes all too natural to them. But for others, of course, it's, it's more difficult. And the higher you climb in the corporate world and the working world, you know, the more relevant this concept actually is. You need to prove yourself and you need to show other people just how valuable you are. But I like what it says or what King David says in Psalm 29, and he takes a different approach. He says this, he says, give Unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. You know, here is a king, the highest position in the land, and he is saying something different. You know, it, it would be all too natural for a king or a, a president or a prime minister to praise their own works. After all, that will help them in the election. But when it comes to King David, he says, Give unto the Lord glory due to his name. You know, to me, this is something that I look at and I'm encouraged to respond in the same way. You know, where God has been there, where God has delivered us, where God has equipped us and blessed us throughout life, let us turn to him and give him glory due to his name. You know, King David goes on further and he says, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. To me, this is special. You know, God's glory is indeed beautiful. Um, it is indeed holy, and we are called to worship him in it. Well, our first hymn this morning is a classic hymn, classic worship hymn and praise hymn entitled, O Worship the King. This morning, let us come before the Lord into, the, into his beautiful presence. Let us worship him, let us ascribe to him greatness and the glory that is due to his name. Let us take up this hymn together. Hymn number 10, O Worship the King. <clears throat> well, last week we learned from um, Exodus uh, chapter 16, where the people of Israel were led out of Egypt by the might and the power of God. 
And they came to a point two months into their journey where they then unleashed complaints against Moses and Aaron. You know, God had led them through the Red Sea and delivered them from the Egyptians. He had protected them, but the people were then faced with what was ahead of them, the wilderness. And they complained in such a manner that they said they would have rather died in Egypt than face the difficulty ahead of them. You know, to me, this example in Exodus seems familiar in today's world. When we're faced with difficulties or our own version of a journey into the wilderness, uh, we can be frightened and scared. We can easily forget how God has delivered us over and over again throughout our lives. You know, even worse than being scared is we can often blame others for our situation. You know, I remember when I first um, started working and there were all the fears about not getting a job. And I remember the, the stack of rejection letters that, uh, that I collected, definitely not good for one's self-esteem. No wonder mental health is so bad these days. But then I did get this job, right? And that was great. I was happy. But then it turned out to be the most miserable job of my life. And two months in, I was more than happy to, to call it quits. But at that point, I, I remember feeling like a failure, and facing, I suppose, the wilderness of being jobless. And also the thought of really just stuffing up that start of my career. You know, that time I, I did attribute blame to, to my employer. But when I look back and I look at it and reflect, I guess two things stand out. One is that my own judgment and wisdom was questionable in my job selection, and, and I acknowledge that. And the second thing was that the experience itself of that job was actually very valuable in, in times to come, in years to come. Um, and I, I leaned on that experience for my future work. You know, my, my lesson learnt in all of this is that in times of helplessness, in times of hopelessness, you know, God is there. You know, and we should not forget about how God would lead us and how God would bless us if we would place our trust in him. Our next hymn speaks about God's grace and his glory, and it takes the form of a most wonderful prayer, and it would say this, it will say, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour. You know, in the second stanza, it says the same prayer, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. In the third stanza, it says, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. And then finally, it will say, grant us wisdom, grant us courage, that we fail not man nor thee. What a wonderful prayer, and to seek the Lord's wisdom, to seek his courage, I think will put us in really good stead to face life. Um, I'm going to invite you all to sing this with me, God of grace and God of glory. You know, the people of Israel, they launched their complaints against Aaron and Moses, but ultimately their complaints were against God. You know, complaints are, are difficult to deal with. Um, at my old work, um, there was a whole division set up just to take complaints and this was probably one of the toughest jobs for anyone. You know, you literally had to be trained up to bite your tongue and to do the customer service thing, that is to smile, give them some freebies, and send them on their way. You know, to me, when someone makes a complaint against you, your natural state is to be defensive. It is to distance yourself. It is to question the complaint to see if it is warranted. And if it's not warranted, well, this just worsens the situation. You know, the last thing that you want is to give in to an unjust complaint or be anywhere close to that person. But when it comes to God, well, God reacted differently in Exodus 16. You know, Moses would say of what God would do for them. He would say that 
they shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears their complaints. You know, God did not condemn them or distance himself from them, but rather he would hear them, he would respond to them in order to show them his glory. He would give them um, what they had desired. But not only this, God would say to them, and he would say, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. You know, despite these complaints, God would still invite his people to draw near to him. Not distance himself, but draw them closer. You know, this strikes me because it's out of God's amazing love that he would deal with us so graciously. He would respond to us even when we are not right in our ways. He would still invite us to draw close to him. You know, I've, I've come across people in my life that have complained against me or wronged me. And for me, it's difficult to afford them grace. You know, how much more wonderful is it to think about how God would afford us his grace when we wrong him, when we disappoint him, and when we sin against him. Our God is a gracious God and a most glorious one. Well, our next hymn speaks about this wonderful grace that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, this hymn is a generally familiar hymn, but I want to draw your attention to two key phrases in this hymn. And the first one is from the first stanza where it says, the wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. You know, a grace that is greater than all our sin, that is a very big grace. It's something not to be taken lightly, not to be taken for granted, but to be greatly appreciated. And the second phrase I'd like to draw your attention to is a bit further down where it says, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. You know, God's grace through our Lord Jesus will reach each and every one of us if we would allow it. And I think that is truly special. That grace that God would afford his people in Exodus is the same grace that through the Lord Jesus we can receive as well. I'm going to ask you all to rise and stand with me and sing this hymn together. Please be seated. Thank you for your singing. And I'll pass this time to Pastor Chris. Thanks, Nick. The series of messages that we will be studying over the pulpit for the month of November and the month of December, all the way to Christmas and beyond, actually, is on the subject of the glory of God. Okay, now where is this theme taken from? Okay, if you would turn with me firstly to the Gospel of Luke, and then we see in chapter 2, right? So if you got one of our Bibles, you shouldn't have too much difficulty. You got tabs on your Bible, right? And that is helpful. In Luke chapter 2 and then verse 9, Right? And we read a familiar account here where we know at Christmas we usually have this red, the shepherds were there, right, keeping watch, not washing their socks, but watch over their flock by night. Okay, but now look, look at verse 9. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and then we read, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And what was their reaction? They were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. So this great joy is associated with the message of the birth of Christ but we note the glory of the Lord shone around, right? So it needed to be explained. So we're going to take time to trace this glory that it was seen then, but it was seen before in different manifestation, but nonetheless seen. 
And we're going to ask ourselves, how do we understand the glory of God? How do we actually understand it? Okay, now, uh, in your bulletin, there are poems printed, uh, you know, every week and on the theme. And this Sunday on page 11 is on the manifestation of God's glory. This is taken from Exodus. But I thought I would like to read uh, to you, actually, a poem that Pastor Charlie wrote that will be printed in a few weeks' time. But I thought it's helpful. This is really helpful. And it's entitled, The Senses God Has Given Us. Now, that's interesting. This may help us to appreciate it. Okay? How do we actually understand it? God, we need to use all our senses. Sight, hearing, even taste, everything, all the senses that God has given us is meant to be employed to understand and to appreciate. Okay? Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, thing here. Look at this. The senses God has given us. A senseless person describes one who has not used them. He does not realize that these senses are like gems. They are precious and they are to be used to the utmost. The glory of God would then become refreshingly precious. The miracles of Jesus were often associated with our senses. The blind receive sight and the deaf hear again. Notice how precious. With these senses restored, we can appreciate God afresh. Our souls have a new sense of appreciation and are refreshed. The senses have a way of raising a new sense of appreciation. They enable us to be grateful for all of God's wonderful creation. We are then able to smell the freshness of spring air. God is more treasured when we know He is there. The senses that God has given help us in many ways. We have a new sense of life and energy every day. Let us be thankful that God has given us many senses. May we be able to see God's glory with great freshness. You see, that's how we are meant to appreciate, to understand God's glory, God's goodness, His majesty. Employ our senses. And that is, I thought, a really helpful poem, okay? Think about this as we read the Scriptures together. We read, the glory of the Lord shone, the manifestation, a bright light. They heard what the angel said, and then joy came to their heart. See, we need all the sense. And the, one of the senses above all this that God has given is an awakening of the soul. When God makes us alive in our soul, it affects all our senses. We begin to appreciate God for who He is. We begin to appreciate, even in, later on we have fellowship, as we eat, we taste, we give thanks, God, you have provided. You'd be surprised if this sense is awakened. It literally affects, it brings so much more gladness to a heart every day. A person can eat and not give thanks, or a person can eat I'd be just so grateful and thankful to God all the time, right? And that is wonderful uh, to able to, to see it, okay? Now, of course, there's the famous joke about this lady that just, you know, every day she gave thanks to God. She really, she would look at it, and it could be a very hot weather like yesterday, and she, you know, thank God that, you know, I could feel the heat and summer, the warmth. And she just, and it really irritated the neighbor who was an atheist. Didn't believe in God and it just so angry. Why you keep on giving thanks to God? Right? It is the sun. You should thank the sun, not God. 
Now, this lady was, you know, uh, even when she went through challenges, she didn't have very much. She couldn't uh, provide for herself. She would still choose to thank God. And one day, yeah, right, that she was giving thanks to God, uh, the doorbell rang, and then she opened it, and there was a beautiful basket of uh, food that was there, and she looked at it, and she th gave thanks to God. And so the neighbor took the opportunity, jumped out, and said, God did not provide. I did. I bought it. It's not your God. And so she smiled at him, gave thanks. Thank you, Lord, for providing for me, and you made the devil pay for it. <laughs> you know, really, I, like, I know that story has been said so many times, but, you know, it just captures the moment. You really, this lady, this sense, you know, God is just so real. You can't see God. Sure, but you can sense it. What is that? There is more than just our five senses. There is a sense deep within. You know God is here. But God knows us and needs to help us to employ all the senses that is going to be there. Okay, well, let's think about this. We're going to pray together, and then we're going to read the book of Exodus once again. Okay? Our Father, we pray and we give thanks first and foremost for the senses that you give to us for life, not just to appreciate the different things which we can see, feel, touch, experience, but where we can sense your presence. Help us to awaken our sense from within that we may actually know and appreciate your glory. Help us to see glimpses of it. As we read the scriptures, help us to learn how Israel saw and how we too have lessons to learn on this subject of the glory of yours. We ask that you would hear this, our prayers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, let's take a look at uh, Exodus, okay, for starters. Now, we're going to take a look at a few passages uh, over here, right? And we see the glory of God manifested differently, okay? So it's not just one thing. We see different manifestations which we need to appreciate. Now, let's begin with Exodus chapter 13 over here, right? Now, chapter 13 is where uh, we read of how God is going to lead them. Now, they are just exiting Egypt, right? You live there for 400 years. Now, it's not easy to leave a place that has been there for so long. Right? Out there is the unknown. So all those who are migrants, they can, we can understand, you leave your home, your ancestors have lived, and then you go to a new place. Not so easy. Lots of uncertainties. What will be your assurance? God gave this word of assurance to them. In verse 19, we read what Moses said, God will surely visit you. And you will carry up my bones from here with you. Now, this is a reference to what Joseph said. And he said with eyes of faith, God will do this. He will come and when he comes, Take my bones with you to the promised land that God has given to us. Now, Mo Joseph has long gone and this word is being fulfilled. What we want to look at is this promise. God will surely visit you. How do you know? What is the evidence? And God gave a very special manifestation. In verse 21, we read, The Lord went before them. By day, a pillar of cloud to lead them the way. How wonderful it is to know that God leads us in life. And this manifestation was that of a pillar of cloud. By day and by night, different. By night, it would be a pillar of fire. You see the change 
from cloud, day, night, fire that would lead them, provide light, provide warmth, and God will not take it, and He did not, we read, He did not take it away. See, it's not just something to see. What does it represent? That God is there. He's, he said He will visit you how you know. This is a very visual experience. So they saw. Cloud by day, fire by night. Right? Now, let's go on further in Exodus 19 now. Okay? Why does God do this anyway? Why does He manifest Himself in such a special way that we can experience Him as it were? And we could see for ourselves. We could hear for ourselves. Why? Now, this is really, really wonderful to see. Okay? In chapter 19, verse 4, right? Uh, Moses said to uh, the people of Israel, You have seen, see, see, eyes, what God did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. What does it mean? What are we looking at? When we see the glory of God there, God has brought you to myself. Now, that's special. Verse 5, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. Now, how would it be spoken of? Uh, look at this in verse 9. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in a thick cloud. Now, there's another manifestation. And the people may hear when I speak to you. So God will allow His own voice to be heard, his, to be seen as a thick cloud, that they may believe what is being spoken. What is it? What did God just say? Why does God do this? That they will belong to something so special. You see, the ex this is an experience they do. You will be to me a special treasure above all people. Not, do we understand this? To belong to something special. I don't know whether you, you, be you feel you belong to something special when you belong to God as His people. I certainly do. You don't? I certainly do. But God says, this is what I am bringing you to myself for, a special treasure. How, what a privilege to belong to something as special as this. Right? Now, we can belong to many things. We can belong to a company. We can belong to a family. We can belong to an association here. That, the other thing. That could be very meaningful and very special. But is it not above all to belong to this would be special? Above all things? See, that should lift up the heart. Should encourage to be able to actually hear the voice of God speaking. That is pretty amazing. Right? So, chapter 13, chapter 13, uh, 13, 19. Now, we go to chapter 24. Okay, because chapter 24 is the, uh, this morning's text that we want to look at. Right? Now, there we go. One, to know that God personal presence, He leads us in life. To know we can belong to this, to Him as a special treasure, His people. Now, chapter 24, now, 19 to 24, you can read it on your own. 
right? There's a series of, of what has been spoken, God taught them what it means to be His people, the commandments were given, lots of details. That one, we don't have time. So we go straight to chapter 24 over here, right? Now, there is another very special experience. What is it? Now, let's read. Chapter 24, verse uh, 17 to begin with. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, if you read it just on its own like that, we really, frankly, don't know what it really means. They saw fire, consuming fire, which is, to me, just pretty frightening, right? You see sites, you know, yesterday, there was this terrible fire. I mean, we know New South Wales has been burning. And then over, we had uh, images of, of the fire that is a consuming some properties has been consumed, cars, and it is frightening. Every time you see something like that, it is not easy to see. But what is this? How can the glory of the Lord like a consuming fire on top of the mountain? I don't think you want to draw near. Now, chapter 24 is very, very interesting. Let's take a look at this. The first part of it. Okay, So let's try and understand this bit by bit with the time that we have. In verse 1, the Lord, and he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, two sons of Aaron, they formed the priesthood. Right? And 70 of the elders of Israel. These were the leaders. We read this earlier on, that Moses cannot do everything on his own. You know, morning to night, he's ministering to people. And so in wisdom, he needed others, people who will fear the Lord, who would have faith. There will be wisdom there, which God's Spirit will be upon now. Seventy elders. This would make up the leadership of the congregation here, right? As we are seeing. So God says to uh, him, these people stated, come up and worship from afar. Oh, that's interesting. This entire chapter is about worship. Now that is a very special experience that God gives. I wonder whether you actually realize worship is a very special experience if we actually understand it. See, we come to worship, we, we, there, our senses are there. We see we listen, right? We look around, we, we read, we participate. We employ some of our senses, but unfortunately, we don't employ all. Now, if you come, you switch completely off, shut down mode, that's your loss. Obviously, right? And of course, God cannot and will not bless, as we see later how He blessed. Now, this is interesting. He calls this group, there are the leaders, come. So in worship, actually, we have an invitation from God to worship Him. Have you ever thought of worship as, first, God needs to invite you. Come. Worship from afar. Now, the, the word interesting, from afar, and then we read in verse 2, Moses alone shall come near the Lord, and, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. Now there's a distinction. Here the leaders can come up, but stop right there. You worship group far. Only Moses singled out, come, worship from a near. Why is that? Why only Moses can draw near, the rest not? Now, we are going to see how Moses understood worship. 
You see, when we don't understand worship, we can actually harm ourselves if we just come. That is, is something. So bear some time from afar. You can observe. From afar, you can observe. So people can come. You just watch from afar. Okay, yeah, I observe, but from afar. But who draws near? Moses, you come near. Now, take a look at what Moses is like. That God would call him the way he does. Does he understand the important aspects of worship? A lot of people don't, you see. But Moses does. Now, let's take a look at this very, very carefully. In verse 3, we read, So Moses came as God invited him, told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. What is an important aspect of worship? What is the most important aspect of worship? Now, Moses was right. The word of the Lord was proclaimed. See, a lot of people look for the music. Well, the music is good. The, this is good. That is good. Not that they are bad. Thank God for the choir. Thank God for the musician. Did you notice you had live music? I thought Joanna and um, uh, uh, Hui Min and Elijah played well. Just keep on doing that. That's beautiful. But is that the most important part of worship? Listen. Here, Moses understood the word of the Lord was spoken. Right? Now, let's all go on further. And then we read, all the people answered, with one voice and said all the words which the Lord has said we will do. What is important? Not just the word of God declared your response. God notes. This is an appropriate response to the word of God. Right? And then we go on further. This is the response. So some people don't don't, they're not listening, they're not obviously cannot respond. How, how come their life is not blessed is pretty obvious. Right? Now, this Moses teach them, listen, and they responded. Now, read verse 4. Now, this is amazing. To me, he's already said, God said to him, and then he is already told the people the words of the Lord, he's done his part. What did he do after that? We read in verse 4, and Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. Wow. It just tells you something. It tells you that this person really value and treasure the word of God. When you don't write something down, you will forget it. True? You just listen. After a while, forgotten. The moment you go out, the moment you have, it's forgotten. A person that truly regard and treasure will write down. This is why we, you, you look around, some people have pen and note and they're writing down. I hope they're writing down the lessons rather than drawing a profile of themselves. But of course, look at it, they treasure it. They pen of course, in those days, not pen and paper, but whatever instrument is employed, they, he, Moses, wrote it down. All the words. He's the teacher, he's already delivered it, and he goes back and he writes it. Look at this. He rises up early in the morning, and then he prepares this worship. He built an altar. All God said was, come, worship me. He's doing all this. He goes and prepares the altar at the foot of the mountain, 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes. Look at his preparation. Right? As in worship, this is why we prepare the way we do. Now then he does something very interesting. Verse 5, He sent the young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings, sacrificed peace offerings to the ox, 
to the oxen, to the Lord. He involved the next generation. That's interesting. You see, this is an experience. You listen, you respond, senses. In experiencing, you learn, you capture something. Otherwise, you won't be able to understand or appreciate. He gave this experience to the young people, young leaders. See, we must look at the young people and help them, encourage them, go ahead, involve them in worship, which we do. The leaders involved which we see. The young next generation, for all who wants to, come on over. This will be a wonderful experience for you. Right? Pastor Charlie has been writing a special article to all the young leaders every week since anniversary finished. Did you notice? This is up to the third month. And I hope they all are reading it and studying it to help the young, so that they may not just read for themselves, but to be experience this worship. They will carry the, the animal, they will, the needs to be slaughtered, they will offer, the smell will be there, every part, it will stay with them. That's what, how we involve others. The next generation must be involved. Now that is very wise of Moses to do that. Right Now, look at what he does. Then Moses took half the blood and put it into the basin and then sprinkled the blood on the altar, took the book of the covenant, read it in the hearing of all the people, and then he said to them, all that the Lord said we will do. Now again, response. And then Moses took the blood, sprinkled on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which... The blood which the Lord has made with you according to all these things. See, it is to be understood. It is to be experienced. I mean, you cannot forget such an experience. This, the symbol, the significance is obvious. It was to represent the Lord's cleansing and sanctification on the people that is there. Right? The idea of to be holy before God. Now, the next part of this is what God does. The first part is what man, we, you, know, you, you prepare, you, you do your part, you seek God diligently, you re, you're writing down His Word, and so on and so forth, right? Now, look how God will bless that worship experience. So there are two parts in worship. Our part is necessary. To fail on our part, we will miss but when we do our part, look what God does. And we read, Moses went up, right? As God said, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 elders. Look what they saw. And they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like a, the very heavens in its clarity. Oh, that is a very special manifestation, a glimpse of the heavenly realm. With all honesty, I had to Google sapphire stone because I've never seen one in real life. What is sapphire stone? Have you ever seen the sapphire stone? Maybe you have, maybe you're wearing one. The price of a sapphire stone ranges from $5,000 a carat to 130000 just to let you know. A carrot. Not, not carrot as in rabbit, eat carrot. <laughs> Diamond worth. It's blue and it's brilliance. It's just no idea what did they see. This is a manifestation of the glory of God. It's as if you've seen the heavenly realm. It's hard to describe it, for such is experience of this kind. This God enabled them to see. Not the rest. The rest afar. Here, draw near, see. Right now, look, look at these things here. 
and we read, the, but the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hands. In other words, you can be nobles, you can be prominent people before God. But if you're not a person that regard his word, you're not a person that regard holy things, his hand of blessing is not on you. You have to be a person that understand the holiness of God and you regard his word. Right? And then we read how God blessed them. We're very, very interesting. And they ate and they drank. Fellowship. Can we experience a glimpse of God's glory in worship like this in, and then it will enhance your fellowship? But miss the glory of God. It's just food. We, we don't know what they ate. Maybe mountain. I don't know what is up in the mountain. What did they drink? Not mentioned. Notice, not mentioned. The focus is not the food. The focus on what they saw, and it's not the food. The brilliance, the glory of, right, and is only at the feet of God. I, it's so amazing and hard to imagine this. And God said to Moses, verse 12, Come up to me on the mountain and be there, just Moses. The rest of the leaders can have this wonderful experience, this wonderful fellowship, but Moses was singled out. You come up to me, I will give you, now oh, that's special, tablets of stone, the law and the commandments which I have written, and you may teach them. God will give him something others cannot even dream to touch. God writes the very words and he will give it to him. He can actually touch the word of God. And only a person who regards the word of God is worthy. If you have no regard, forget about it. You better not observe from afar. Right? Leaders who understand it, they must catch a glimpse of God's glory that their heart will be uplifted. Young people involve them that they may also have this experience. Moses was given a very special glimpse, an experience of the glory of God. Now that is absolutely amazing as we read over here, right? And then we read how Moses gave instructions for them. They had to wait there. Verse 15, Moses went up into the mountain. A cloud covered the mountain. Now, there is cloud. Okay? To them is fire. You are not going to go into the fire unless you are fireproof. To Moses, not fire. And majestic cloud. He goes into the cloud and he is there 40 days, 40 nights. Even 40 days, 40 nights, not long enough to be in such fellowship experience with God. You see, why this, what, how do we understand this? Worship is something that we need to understand, to experience for ourselves. And God needs to help the people to understand it bit by bit. How comes more, some people have more of the experience of worship than others? By our response. By our response. What do you want to see? Will you see fire? Some stay away. Better fear the Lord. Right? They have seen it before and they trembled. Some, they can draw near. To them, it's a cloud. To them, it's a beautiful glimpse. It is uplifting. It is wonderful. They draw near. That is something we need to think about. Let's 
take time to examine how we understand the glory of God. Right? What is our challenge? You know what our challenge is? On all levels. One, for all who are leaders. All who are serving, all who are leaders. We have a special privilege. Will we not prepare ourselves? Will we not behold the glory of God? Worship for us is an uplifting experience to all who lead in worship. What an opportunity. To all who are young people, you're the next generation. I'm not talking kids, because kids cannot carry those things. These would be young adults. You have an opportunity to experience being part of worship, being part of service. Would you not make the best out of your opportunity to see the glory of God? Right? To all who are God's people, we belong to something special. We belong to Him as His people. Will we learn to draw near? We will learn to regard His Word better. Will we learn to treasure the things that are holy? And perhaps God will say, come, draw near. Let me show you something. Let me give you something that will just really enhance your life and your ministry. This is what I value. And so the challenge is, how do we hear God's word? Cultivate spiritual sense. Don't just hear and see the music and all around. How do you cultivate this? God wants us to, as it were, hear Him speak to you. Have you learned to listen to Him? Have we learned to respond appropriately to God? We hear, we don't do. We hear, we don't take heed. It's not just hearing. They were learning baby steps. Whatever you say, Lord, we will do. Okay, that's step one. But Moses has gone beyond step one. They are just in step one, but they need to begin with step one. You know what? Try. Try to take heed to the Word of God. Try to obey the Word of God and watch what, how God will draw you dear. And thirdly, worship must be with tremendous reverence. Can we see the glory of God? If you can, if you have caught a glimpse, you will just stand in awe of the Lord. They're in a mountain. They're not in a building. What is there to see? They obviously saw something that God gave special. You can be in a beautiful building like such and see nothing. We can have nice fellowship out later on and yet hmm, it's just another Sunday. It's just another. See, that's, then we would have missed it. Let God put His hand upon you and bless you. Let Him Open your eyes. Let him open your ears. Let him restore your senses all over again and see the reality of your God who will lead you, who will guide you, who will bless you. Let's pray together. Our Father, we pray this morning that you would open our eyes to read these words with not just understanding, but with a desire that we must respond. Our experience of worship depends on how we regard you. To some, it is just standing afar, seeing nothing but fire. But to others who regard you, they draw near and they see something so special. They see the very presence of your throne room in heaven. What an uplifting sight. And we pray that our young people will be able to see your glory. We pray for our young leaders. We pray for all who are here. That your hand, will be, your hand of blessing will come upon us. Lord, open all our senses that we may behold your glory and find great joy in knowing you and in belonging to you as your people. We ask that you would hear this, our prayer, and bless us. 
as we give an offering, Lord, receive it. We ask that you would receive and encourage us and grant us that joy. Bless every cheerful giver, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm looking forward to this week. Pastor Charlie will be coming over Tuesday to Thursday. He will be teaching on the subject of the glory of God. There is so much to learn. The only thing is our limitation is that clock. But for some, he's very happy. All right, okay, time's up. But you know what? And you, 40 days, 40 nights for Moses is not enough. He can spend there 40 days, 40 nights nights listening to what god has said beholding his listening to his voice to those who are 40 seconds is too long but to those who really appreciate god 40 days 40 nights isn't a very long time at all he can forego the fellowship and and spend time with god up in the mountain now that is a very special experience that only moses was given at that time Right? Well, let us, let us tr really treasure this and learn from this, how our hearts can be uplifted when we come to God, when we can understand this, and where we can regard and honor God as He should be. Okay? Well, we're going to sing one last hymn together, and this, we must never lose sight of how we are God's people. And the challenge is to ask God to give us a renewed vision of this. Sometimes we can lose sight. We are so busy in the world, we can lose sight. We are so caught up with ourselves, with our job, with our family, with everything in life, weighed down, we can lose sight. This is a prayer. Almighty Father, give us a vision, sight. Not just physical to be able to catch a glimpse of the world we live in, of a dying world that needs your love and care. Can we not see the need, the yearning for a saviour? The world cannot see Jesus physical, obviously. None of us can. But can they not see God's people? That we will be God's people in this place. Live His goodness. We've tasted the goodness of God. Have we not? We've experienced His salvation. Have we not? Then can we not share it, proclaim it through His Son to everyone? Let the church regain its vision, ours and more. Let's ask the Lord to hear this, our prayer and bless. Let's sing this together. God's people, to be God's people. Okay, let's rise as we sing together. Let's ask that the Lord will bless us to all who will hear his word, who will respond appropriately to it with faith and obedience. May this blessing be yours. And now may this living God, who is gloriously manifested, in the scriptures, open our senses that we may behold the glory of God. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ sanctify us. May the blood that he shed cleanse us from our sins that hinders us to see him spiritually. May the grace be ours that we may experience the reality of God in our heart, in our life. May the Spirit of God dwell with us, enabling us to worship, to fellowship, to enjoy the very presence of the living God. And we ask that these blessings will be ours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.